Now, the trial of the NHS nurse Lucy Letby is continuing at Manchester Crown Court. She wept as she told the court that she was devastated at being accused of murdering seven young babies and the attempted murder of ten others. Asked by her defence lawyer if she'd done anything wrong, no, she replied. She told the jury that she'd only ever done her best to care for the babies. This is a podcast about one of the most anticipated criminal trials for years. It involves the most shocking of allegations the alleged murders and attempted murders of tiny, premature babies at the hands of a neonatal nurse whose very job it was to look after them. Lucy Letby is on trial at Manchester Crown Court, accused of killing seven newborns and injuring ten more at the Countess of Chester Hospital in Cheshire. The jury has now been sitting for eight months. Prosecutors have finished outlining their case and the court has begun hearing from the defence on why they say Lucy Letby is not guilty of the 22 charges that she faces. I'm Liz Hull, Northern Correspondent for the Mail. I will be in court to report on the case as it develops. And I'm Caroline Cheatham, a broadcast journalist. Every week we'll examine what's happened and bring you the details behind the headlines. This is the trial of Lucy Letby. Last week, Nick Johnson KC was finally able to conclude his cross-examination of Lucy Letby. Regular listeners will know that the babies in this trial are not being named for legal reasons, and the identities of their families are also being protected, so we're calling them Babies A to Q. This podcast will go further than the headlines and news reports, but at times you might wonder why we aren't bringing you more detail. That's because we can only tell you what the jury have heard, and that's to preserve the integrity of a fair trial. Seven of the babies died, ten survived. Every one of these babies was or is someone's son or daughter. And the mums, dads and families of every baby are present in court, listening to every detail of how their child was allegedly killed or harmed. In this episode, we'll hear Lucy Letby agree that two of her alleged victims were poisoned with insulin, but not by her. She'll contradict the evidence of doctors and parents and say she didn't see any unusual rashes on any of the babies. We'll also hear she's accused of hanging around after her shift finished to root paperwork out of the bin to take home as souvenirs. And we'll reveal the prosecution say she was plotting to kill all three triplets. Welcome to episode 39, Homicidal Activities. So on Friday, Liz, we recorded an extra episode because there was a lot of evidence about Dr. A and his relationship with Lucy Letby. So we went off on a bit of a tangent so we could bring you that. If you're yet to catch up, do have a listen. But essentially, the prosecutor, Nick Johnson Casey, alleged that Lucy Letby had a crush on Dr. A, who was a registrar on the unit and is someone that we can't name. In fact, he suggested that he was her boyfriend and that she attacked some of the babies to cause a drama to get him into the room. We heard they'd been on days out together to London and shopping to a retail park called Cheshire Oaks near Chester. But Lucy Letby insisted that the two of them were just friends and that Dr A was married, so theirs was a platonic relationship. So today we're going to get back on track with the trial and get back to the babies in the case because in last Monday's episode, Mr Johnson had started questioning Lucy Letby about baby K, but he hadn't finished, so that's where we'll pick this up today. And Baby K was one of the most premature babies in the case. And in fact, doctors at the Countess tried to have her mother transferred before she was born at 25 weeks. But the only bed free was in Bristol and it was too risky to move her. And so in the middle of the night in February 2016, Baby K was born. And it's the prosecution case that within hours, she had her breathing tube tampered with three times by Lucy Letby, who was trying to kill her. Last week, we told you that Lucy Letby told the court she couldn't remember any of the occasions when Baby K's oxygen dropped and her tube had to be reconnected. Her case is that potentially it hadn't been secured properly. But Mr Johnson then asked her about the third time the tube dislodged at 7.30 in the morning. He reminded her of the evidence of another nurse, who we can't name, who previously told the court that it was Lucy Letby who called her in to help when Baby K's oxygen levels dropped. He asked her at least four times why she was in Nursery One with Baby Kay 
at 7.30am when she had responsibility for two other babies not involved in the case in Nursery 2. Each time she responded that she couldn't answer the question because she had no memory of it and she insisted staff moved between different rooms on the unit all the time. Why were you in there? I can't answer that question. The answer, Lucy Let Be, is you were sabotaging Baby K yet again, weren't you? No. Mr Johnson also reminded Lucy Letby that the first time Baby K's breathing tube became dislodged at just before 4am, Dr Ravi Jayram said he saw her near the cot doing nothing. She said she couldn't remember the incident and could not confirm or deny that it happened. But Mr Johnson then suggested this was different to what she'd told police in her interviews when she said she may well have been waiting for Baby K to self-correct after her oxygen levels fell. I have no memory, which is what I've said throughout. There were three occasions when Baby K desaturated on that shift, weren't there? Yes. Each occasion involved a displaced endotracheal tube. Do you agree? I can't recall exactly. If that's the evidence, then yes. The evidence is on each occasion you were there. I can't say that now. The reason for those coincidences is you were trying to kill Baby K, weren't you? No. Mr Johnson also asked her if she'd ever seen or met Baby K's parents and she said she couldn't remember, so he questioned her about why she'd been searching for them on Facebook more than two years later. Why were you searching for them on April 20th, 2018, two years later? Because I thought of babies on the unit over the years and do look back on the parents. Your recollection is you have no real memory of Baby K? No, not in any detail, no. You have a very good memory for names? Yes. She was transferred out of the Countess of Chester Hospital shortly afterwards. How did you remember the name? I can't answer that. Surely it is something you can answer, because it's a feat of memory. Tell us how you remember. I can't. Can't or won't? I can't. Is it because the true answer is you remember her because you tried to kill her? No. Now, one of the central allegations in this case is that Lucy Letby used insulin as a method of attacking babies. And the prosecution say baby F and baby L were the focus for these attacks, which were eight months apart. Now, the boys who weren't related to each other suffered hypoglycemic episodes where their blood sugar dropped dangerously low before they both recovered. Both boys were twins, and the prosecution say their brothers were also attacked by Lucy Letby. They were baby E and baby M. We explained more about Baby E in last Monday's episode, and we're going to come to Baby M shortly. Now, significantly, Lucy Letby doesn't dispute that the boys were poisoned. Tests showed they had levels of insulin in their blood, which were off the scale, which had to have been given to them because it couldn't have been made naturally. So she accepts somebody poisoned the boys, but crucially, she says it wasn't her. So Mr Johnson asked her about who was on duty on the shifts when baby F and baby L were poisoned. And he pointed out that only she and nurse Belinda Williamson were working on the night shift of August the 4th, 2015 and the day shift of April the 9th, which were the two shifts in question. But it's worth mentioning here that nurse Williamson was asked about this when she gave evidence earlier in the trial and she denied on oath giving insulin to either of the babies. Isn't the reality that unless there's more than one poisoner, it has to be you or Belinda Williamson? I can only answer for myself and say I've never put insulin into any bags. It was never suggested to Belinda Williamson that she did it, was it? I can't answer that. Mr Johnson said it was on the night shift of August the 4th when baby F's blood sugar dropped dangerously low and he vomited around half an hour after Lucy Letby helped his nurse, who we can't name, set up a drip of intravenous feed for him at around 25 past midnight. She told jurors she couldn't remember exactly who'd hung up the bag of feed, but she thought it was her colleague. She agreed someone must have given baby F the insulin unlawfully, but that she couldn't answer whether he'd been specifically targeted. And she also said she didn't think the insulin could have been put into the bag by accident by anyone on the unit. She did, however, say it was a possibility that the insulin was put in the bag elsewhere in the hospital, such as the pharmacy department where the bags were made up. 
Mr Johnson then moved to the day shifts of April the 9th and 10th when he says baby L was poisoned and he reminded the jury that his blood sugar remained persistently low despite him being on a drip of dextrose to try to boost it. It's the prosecution case that Lucy Letby poisoned the bags of dextrose when his designated nurse, Mary Griffith, left to the intensive care nursery to help give some medicine to a baby in another room. That was the opportunity you took to poison baby L, wasn't it? No, I do not know how the insulin got there. Whoever did it, did it deliberately, didn't they? If it happened on the unit, yes. We've established it had to have happened on the unit sometime between midnight and 9.30am because that bag was connected to baby L throughout. Yes, other than a cannula being replaced. That's why it was a targeted attack, isn't it? What do you say? Not by me, it wasn't. Not by you? By somebody else? Yes. Poisoning of a child in the same way that baby F was poisoned? Yes. With the same substance? Yes. The reality is that unless there's more than one poisoner, it has to be you or Belinda Williamson. I can only answer for myself and say I've never put insulin into any bags. It was never suggested to Belinda Williamson that she did it. I can't answer that. Mr Johnson then moved on to baby L's brother, who's baby M. as the prosecution case that Lucy Letby tried to murder him by injecting air into his bloodstream on the same shift on April the 9th. He almost died and needed 30 minutes of CPR and six shots of adrenaline before his heart was kick-started and he was brought back to life. Mr Johnson asked Lucy Letby whether staffing issues contributed or caused his collapse. She said the unit was very busy and running at near capacity with 15 babies being looked after in total. Even though Baby M was not classed as an intensive care baby, he was placed in the corner of Nursery One next to his brother, rather than in a proper cot space, she said. Is it your case staffing levels caused or contributed to his collapse? I don't know what caused his collapse, but I think that potentially, yes. I know we were very stretched that day, and Baby M wasn't in the correct bay either. He wasn't on a proper monitor, he was in a corner space, which wasn't ideal. The unit was very busy. Babies were not as closely monitored as perhaps there would have been, with more staff or less babies. He reminded her about the evidence of Dr Jram, who previously told the jury that he'd seen an unusual discoloration on baby M's skin at the time of his collapse. He said there were bright pink patches on his torso that flitted around and eventually vanished when he recovered. He said it was unusual and very similar to the rash he'd seen on baby A ten months earlier. So Mr Johnson asked Lucy Letby about this rash. Do you agree with his description? I didn't see anything like that, no. Did the lighting in Nursery One make it difficult to see? No, I do remember his colour was a little bit harder to assess with him being an Asian baby and in a corner space where there was poor lighting. But she admitted that the lighting was much brighter in there than in Nursery Two. And this is relevant because we need to take you back a bit here to baby I. She was the baby in the cot in Nursery Two which was covered by a canopy. Lucy Letby claimed she could see from the doorway that baby I was pale, moments before she was found blue in her cot. It's the prosecution case that she couldn't have seen baby I from that position near the doorway. A much lighter corner than in Nursery 2. Yes. You know what I'm going to say, don't you? I was able to see baby I. This time you're saying that although the nursery was in daytime, the light was not good enough to see baby M's change in colour? No. It was harder for me to assess. I was not used to caring for an Asian baby. The colour change was difficult for anyone to see. Mr Johnson reminded her of the evidence of the twins' mother, who told the court that she and her husband had just left the nursery when baby M collapsed at just before 4pm. This is another case where the parent had been there but left and the baby collapsed? Yes. That was your opportunity to sabotage him, wasn't it? No. And he asked her about a blood test result and resuscitation notes which were written on a paper towel that were found under her bed by police after she was arrested. Another nurse who was on duty and we can't name previously told the trial that it was her practice to put the blood test result in the confidential waste bin on the unit at the end of the shift. 
Why did you take the blood gas record home? Same as the handover sheets. They came home in my pocket. Are you seriously suggesting somebody else put it into your pocket? No, I'm saying I definitely didn't take anything out of the confidential waste bin. Who put it in the bag under your bed? Me. Why put it in your bag? Because I collect paper. But not bank statements. What makes a blood gas record collectible, but a bank statement shreddable? The handover sheets came back with me, and they would be put to one side and not thought about again. With household bills, they come through. I pay the bill and shred the document. Are you making this up as you go along? No. Mr Johnson pointed out that Dr Tony Uko, who's one of the doctors who helped with the resuscitation of baby M, needed the paper towel to write his computerised notes of the shift at around 8.30pm. Lucy Letby herself wrote her notes on the computer around 45 minutes later, at quarter past nine. So Mr Johnson accused her of hanging around for over an hour after the end of her shift to root in the bin to get her hands on the documents so she could take them home as souvenirs. You hung around to get your hands on it before you left? No, I stayed late that night to cover all the work that needed doing. I had to hand over baby M and the other babies I had and write the nursing notes for baby M. You waited until 9.14pm, one and a quarter hours after the end of your shift, to make this note? No, I disagree. I was busy with other babies on the unit, not sitting and waiting to do this documentation. You were hanging around to get your hands on the paperwork used by Dr Uko and to go rooting in the bin for the printout put there by your colleague. No, I've never rooted in the bin. Because you sabotaged Baby M by injecting him with air, didn't you? No, I did not. Next, Mr Johnson moved on to Baby N. He was the baby with haemophilia. Lucy Letby is accused of trying to murder him three times. Once, when he was around a week old in the early hours of June the 3rd, 2016, and twice on a day shift 12 days later on June the 15th, the day his parents were due to take him home. Mr Johnson reminded the jury that on the night of the first attack, nurse Christopher Booth was the nurse assigned to baby N. Lucy Letby had two babies in nursery four. He pointed out that phone records showed that from the moment she started the shift at around 7.30pm until 8.45pm, she was texting her best friend, who's another nurse who we can't name, non-stop about baby N and how everyone was a bit panicked about his condition. But Mr Johnson said nursing charts showed she was supposedly feeding one of the babies she was looking after, who isn't involved in the case, at around half past eight. And he said this was significant because she'd previously told the jury that she couldn't text and feed an infant at the same time because it was a two-handed job. How do you text while doing a two-handed job feeding a child? You can't. Well, you can. There's a way of feeding a child very quickly, isn't there? You think I pushed it in? I do. You tell the jury. No, I did not. How do you push it in? You put a plunger in the end. That's what you were doing, isn't it? No. So Mr Johnson then asked Lucy Letby what she remembered about baby N's collapse at ten past one in the morning, when he was screaming for 30 minutes. She said she had no memory of it, but did accept that it happened when Nurse Booth was on his break. You took that opportunity to sabotage baby N, didn't you? No. This was your doing? No, it was not. Did you want to be in nursery one? No. We've had other babies screaming in this case, haven't we? Yes, some. Baby I and baby O. So baby N survived that attack, but Mr Johnson said on June the 15th he was attacked twice more. He said that Lucy Letby had been assigned to look after baby N the day before on June the 14th and suggested she'd done something to sabotage him before she went home that night. The nursing notes suggested he was unsettled during the early part of the night shift, he said. She denied this, but Mr Johnson said phone records showed she was texting her best friend who'd been working the night shift as soon as she woke up at 5am the next day. In the messages, her friend told her that baby N had been screened for an infection and that he looked like shit. 
Mr Johnson said swipe data from the neonatal unit's entry doors also showed Lucy Letby went to work that day early. She was there by 7.12am and three minutes later, baby N desaturated and his oxygen levels dropped. And he reminded the jury of evidence given by Jennifer Jones Key, who'd been looking after baby N overnight in Nursery 3. She recalled Lucy Letby coming to chat to her as soon as she arrived on the unit. The reason you did something to him when you went off the previous day shift was to give the impression of a progressing decline that you could take advantage of on the day shift of June the 15th. No, that's not what happened. You sent him up to fail at the end of the previous day shift and you were in there before your shift started, making a beeline for him to make it look like he'd come from the night shift with problems. No. This was a serious event, wasn't it? Yes. It happened a minute or so of you arriving in that room? Yes. Just bad luck, was it? Yes. Mr Johnson reminded Lucy Letby that during this shift, Baby N had a swollen throat and blood in his airway. He said it was the prosecution case that she'd shoved a piece of medical equipment down his throat to cause that injury. Mr Johnson said he was explaining this to her so we know where the battle lines are. And he reminded her of the evidence of Dr A, who'd been called to review Baby N after his 7.15 collapse. He told jurors he thought he'd seen blood in Baby N's airway before he first tried to intubate at around 8 o'clock. But she disputed seeing blood until much later that afternoon. Referring to the gang of four consultants who she previously said had it in for her, Mr Johnson asked, Do you accept what Dr A says about the blood? I can't say what he said or thought. I didn't look down his throat. Well, Dr A's not in the gang of four, is he? Did he have it in for you? He was a friend of yours? Yes. Who you say you loved as a friend? Yes, as time went on. Mr Johnson pointed out that in her nursing notes written later on in the shift, Lucy Letby had not mentioned Baby N's collapse at 7.15am and he accused her of trying to create the impression in the paperwork that it happened before she came on duty. He also claimed she'd telephoned Baby N's father to tell him his son had been unwell, but then she'd deliberately written in the nursing record that another nurse had made the call. And that she'd invented in her notes fresh blood on his charts at 10am to make it look like his problems were down to his haemophilia. But she disagreed and denied making any false notes. Mr Johnson reminded the jury that baby N's second deterioration at 10 to 3 that afternoon happened when his parents left the unit briefly to get some food. At that time, Lucy Letby had noted more fresh blood in his mouth and nasal tube. What had you done to baby N? I hadn't done anything to him. This is very similar to what happened to baby E, do you agree? Baby E had significantly more blood, but he did have fresh blood, yes. You had shoved some foreign object down Baby N's throat. That's why he was bleeding. Absolutely not. No. Dr Breary also saw blood in his throat at this time. Do you remember? Yes, if that's what he said. This was all your work? No, it's not. She agreed she'd become agitated when other doctors from Alder Hay Hospital in Liverpool arrived at Chester to try and help intubate Baby N. Did you think eyes from outside might work out what you'd been up to? No, I wanted them to come and help. The nursery was full of people. I didn't know who they were. I'd never experienced people coming from another hospital before. Mr Johnson said that when Baby N collapsed for a final time, all the doctors from the Countess and Alderhay were away from his cot side in a huddle, discussing how they could best help him. Did you take advantage of them being distracted to try and kill him? No. Mr Johnson then turned his attention to the two triplets, Baby O and Baby P, who Lucy Letby is accused of murdering less than 24 hours apart on consecutive shifts at the end of June 2016. This was her first shift back at work after her three-day break in Ibiza. He suggested she was very interested in the brothers and knew they were on the unit before she got to work. She admitted that the triplets' arrival was big news on the unit and that she'd never seen naturally conceived triplets before. Mr Johnson pointed out a text message she'd written to a friend during a conversation about the brothers, in which she'd said she would probably be back with a bang. Within 72 hours of that text, two boys were dead and baby Q had collapsed and it all happened while you were there. 
Yes. Did you want to get involved with them? No, I was just making inquiries. It was something the hospital and other members of staff were talking about. So just to go back a bit, on the day shift of June the 23rd, Lucy Letby was the designated nurse for baby O and baby P, and another baby in nursery too. She was the only nurse in that room. Their brother, the triplet who survived, was in nursery one. Although they were seven weeks early, they weighed between four and five pounds, and they were doing well. Lucy Letby suggested Baby O had a problem with his tummy being swollen, which wasn't dealt with adequately by staff on the previous night shift. But when she was questioned by Mr Johnson about this, she couldn't say exactly what the inadequacy or the problem with his abdomen was. Now it's the prosecution case that she overfed Baby O milk at around 12.30pm, prompting a collapse 45 minutes later. Mr Johnson said she also sabotaged his care again at 2.40pm by injecting air into his tummy. And he reminded the jury of evidence from the expert radiologist Professor Owen Arthurs, who said an X-ray taken soon afterwards showed a large amount of air in his bowel. Mr Johnson also pointed to nursing charts, which he said Lucy Letby had deliberately filled out incorrectly to cover her tracks and make it look like the air had come from oxygen and breathing support, which baby O had, in fact, not been receiving and he accused her of pulling back the feeding tube in his nose so that the air she'd injected into his tummy could not drain out properly. She denied doing any of these things. Mr Johnson reminded the jury that both times Baby O collapsed, she called Dr A to review him. He said the doctor was her boyfriend and she'd sabotaged Baby O to get his attention. He said she wanted him on the unit because she missed him and hadn't seen him for several days while she'd been away. Now, we covered a lot of this on Friday in our bonus episode, so listen back if you want to know more about her alleged motive. And we should stress that Lucy Letby denied any of this or that she was romantically involved with Dr A, who she said was a married man. And when Baby O collapsed for the third and final time, he was crash-called back again, along with four other doctors who fought unsuccessfully to save his life. Mr Johnson reminded the jury of the evidence of Dr Breary and of the triplet's parents, who all described seeing an unusual, moving rash on baby O's swollen tummy at the time of his collapse. Now here's a reminder of what his dad said in a tearful video that was shown to the jury of his interview with police. All his veins, you could see them, all bright blue, going different colours. His whole body looked like it had really, really bad prickly heat that got worse. When it went down again, it was literally like you could see something through his veins. Mr Johnson asked Lucy Letby about the rash, which he said has become a feature of this case. The prosecution alleged Lucy Letby caused the rash by injecting baby O's circulation with air and causing an air bubble in his blood. But she claimed she saw mottling and no rash. Dr Breary saw a disappearing rash. Baby O's mum and dad talked about a moving pattern of colour. Yes. That's the truth, isn't it? I can't comment on their truth. I didn't see anything like that myself. Mr Johnson also asked her about the injury to baby O's liver, which was found during post-mortem. She agreed it must have happened during this shift, but insisted, I don't know how that has happened. You injected baby O's stomach with gas down the nasogastric tube, didn't you? No, I didn't. You injected air into his circulation, causing an embolus. No. And through some violent mechanism, you inflicted that liver injury on him, didn't you? No. Now, baby O continued to decline throughout the afternoon and was pronounced dead at 5.47pm. And Mr Johnson accused her of almost immediately turning her attention to his brother, baby P. He said she also sabotaged him by overfeeding him milk and injecting air into his tummy before she clocked off from work that night. And he pointed to a text message she sent to her best friend while she was walking home. She told her friend about baby O's death and wrote, Worry as identical. Were you setting up a false narrative here? No. You were trying to create in the minds of other people that because baby O had died of some unspecified problem, the likelihood was something was going to happen to one of his siblings. No, that's not what I was suggesting. Because that's what you were planning. No. It was not. You'd already put your plan into motion by pumping air into baby P before you left, hadn't you? No. 
On the way home, you were sowing the seeds with your colleagues, feeding a false narrative, trying to divert attention from your homicidal activities. No. Baby P collapsed three times and died the following day while Lucy Letby was looking after him. Mr Johnson said the first alleged attack came just after Dr Uko had completed his ward round, just after half past nine. He told the court that Lucy Letby was very keen for Dr A to be called to review Baby P. Again, we covered this in Friday's bonus episode. It's the prosecution case that Lucy Letby caused this collapse by injecting air down his feeding tube. Mr Johnson asked her about a handwritten note of his resuscitation, which was found in a bag under her bed by police. How did it get there? I put it there. Why? I collect paper. I have difficulty throwing away paper. Was there something comforting about it? Yes, I keep paper from a variety of different sources. Mr Johnson reminded her about the evidence given by Dr B, the doctor we can't name, who told the jury she'd been shocked when Lucy Letby remarked he's not leaving here alive a few hours before baby P died. And just to remind you, at this point, doctors at the Countess were trying to arrange for him to be transferred to a specialist centre because he was so unwell. Lucy Letby said she couldn't recall making the comment, but admitted that soon afterwards baby P collapsed again. It's the prosecution case that she tampered with his breathing tube. The problem with the tube happened just after the doctors left the room, didn't it? Yes. Just after you had said, he's not leaving here alive. I don't agree, I said that. Is this yet another bit of bad luck that happened just after everybody else had left? Yes. You'll remember Baby P's father said the circumstances of his death were very similar to Baby O's. Yes. Just as I'm suggesting, you had predicted both in your text on the way home after Baby O's death and in your remark to Dr B. No, that's not what happened. The text. That was the portent of doom. No, I disagree. She also denied being excited and behaving inappropriately in the immediate aftermath of Baby P's death. Two babies killed within 24 hours of each other and you were acting in a deliberately inappropriate way. According to Dr B. Just as you'd acted in an inappropriate way with Baby I's mother and Baby C's mother, do you agree? No, I do not. Did you enjoy drama? No. Your portent of doom had fulfilled itself, hadn't it, at your hand? No. You had injected him with air down the nasogastric tube? No. I didn't. Mr Johnson then went even further and he accused Lucy Letby of planning to kill all three of the triplets. The surviving brother, you may remember, was transferred to Liverpool Women's Hospital after his parents begged doctors to move him. Mr Johnson reminded the jury about a yellow note found at her house by police. She'd written it on the triplets' first birthday. Baby P, Baby O and their brother, today is your birthday. But you aren't here, and I'm so sorry for that. You knew Baby O and Baby P were no longer with us. Why were you including their brother in that? I can't answer that. It was just their three names. Is it because in your mind, there was a terminal end in store for their brother if he'd stayed with you? No. Was that your objective, to kill all three? No. Was the prospect of that exciting you? Absolutely not. No. The final victim in this case is Baby Q, and it was to him that Mr Johnson turned his attention as he neared the end of his cross-examination of Lucy Letby. He's the baby boy delivered nine weeks early when his mother's placenta ruptured. It's the prosecution case that Lucy Letby injected him with saline or some other clear fluid, causing him to collapse just after 9am on June the 25th, when his nurse left the room. And remember, this is alleged to have happened the day after baby Pia died, when Dr Breary had tried to stop Lucy Letby coming into work. I'm going to suggest to you that when Mary Griffiths was out of the unit, you pumped baby Q with some clear fluid. That didn't happen. Giving him milk hadn't been an option because he was not getting more than 0.5 millilitres every couple of hours. That's right. If he vomited a large amount of milk, it would be very obvious something was wrong, wouldn't it? That's why you chose clear fluid on this occasion, isn't it? No. He also accused her of leaving the nursery when Nurse Griffith returned unexpectedly 
so she wouldn't be associated with baby Q's collapse. But she denied this, saying she'd been doing cares or giving medication to another baby in nursery one. Well, that's it for episode 39. Mr Johnson has now finished his cross-examination and we've heard everything that Lucy Letby says happened in relation to the babies in the case. But we've still got more to bring you because Mr Johnson wanted to know about four key features. These are the text messages, the gang of four, the Facebook searches and her social life. We're going to bring you all of that in an extra episode, so keep an eye on your feeds for that later this week. In the meantime, the trial is continuing and I'll be in court to listen to the evidence and you can read my reports in the mail and on Mail Plus. You can also follow me on Twitter, at Liz Hull. You can give us a rating and you can share the podcast. You can also follow us on Twitter, at Lucy Let Me Trial, or follow me, at Radio Caroline. Or send us an email at thetrialoflucyletby at gmail.com. See you then. <laughs>